Alors, ben, je veux vous souhaiter la bienvenue euh, au nom du comité organisateur, en fait, euh, donc qui inclut euh, les gens du GIREPS, le groupe de recherche interuniversitaire interdisciplinaire sur l'emploi, la pauvreté et la protection sociale. Aussi, l'axe travail et emploi du CRISE, le centre de recherche sur les innovations sociales, le centre des travailleurs et travailleuses euh, immigrants, CTTI, la chaire UNESCO en communication et technologie pour le développement, l'Institute for Political and Economic Alternatives, et l'Université TELUC euh, qui vous accueille ce soir. Donc, l'objectif du colloque, je le rappelle, vous l'avez sans doute vu et vous en avez été informé, mais euh, c'est d'identifier les insuffisances dans les politiques publiques euh, et puis, bon, qui, au fond, dans, au cours des dernières années, face à l'essor des plateformes numériques et aussi de regarder les nouvelles formes d'action collective possibles. Alors, la plupart d'entre nous avons travaillé sous différents angles sur ces thématiques-là, euh, sur Uber, sur Eva, sur d'autres plateformes de mobilité numérique, de livraison à la demande aussi, euh, et puis aussi sur les entrepôts comme euh, Amazon. Alors, on s'est intéressé tous aux conditions de travail, euh, entre autres, de jeunes immigrants, parfois de moins jeunes aussi, qui travaillent dans ces services-là. Aussi au statut d'emploi et à la gouvernance et à la réglementation, la régulation, donc des sujets qu'on va aborder. Plusieurs d'entre nous ont aussi fait des comparaisons internationales ou interprovinciales, pour ce qui est le cas euh, du Canada. Et donc, c'est un sujet, évidemment, euh, dont on débat depuis euh, quelques années. Et je vais mentionner qu'un livre est prévu à l'issue du colloque. On va en parler euh, samedi. So this conference uh, marks an important landmark, I think, in the research for many people, the research that's been done for the last four years by a lot of the groups that I mentioned uh, just previously, especially between Quebec and uh, Korean researchers that are related to the organizers of the conference. And, uh, well, I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody who cooperated in the organization. I mentioned a few uh, in the beginning, but especially Cholki, of course, everybody knows that he's been at the center of the organization. And I think uh, we really want to thank him very warmly for all the work that he's done for this. Um, I also want to thank the Social Science Research Council of Canada that supported the project. Uh, financial contribution that makes this conference possible. Also the Quebec unions, FTQ and CSN, and the Korea Foundation. So beyond the participants uh, from these two countries, mainly us who are here now, um, there's also some international researchers who will join us. And first I will introduce for tonight our uh, guest, Jamie Woodcock. He's a lecturer from the University of Essex and previously was from uh, New York University in London, also Oxford and Open University. And I think all of you know, he's written quite extensively on the issue, including two very, very well-known books that had a great success, uh, The Gig Economy in 2019 and The Fight Against Platform Capitalism in 2021. So he joins us from Great Britain, I think. Normally he should still be in Great Britain, yes. Um, so, well, normally I'd say the floor is yours, but now I'll say the screen is yours. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's, very, it's very nice to be able to come uh, and speak to all of you. It is slightly later. Uh, here in Britain. Although, of course, if I travelled, I would have been jet lagged enough that it would have felt uh, like it was this time of the of the evening anyway. Um, and I think it sounds like there's an excellent conference, excellent papers that are coming up. So it's uh, you know very nice to be able to join you virtually, but it would be great to be able to uh, to listen to all the all the papers that are going to be that they're going to be talked about uh, over the next two days. Um, but what I want to start off. Um, talking about today is is something that comes out of uh out of one of these these things that I've written about about platform work and I want to to make a bit of an argument about where things are at with with research uh in platform work um and some of the dynamics that are beginning to emerge internationally when we think about uh about about platform work and platform workers and the the kinds of struggles uh, that many of these workers have been have been involved in, um, and for me, this this really begins uh, in 2016 when I first started doing uh, research with delivery riders, with food delivery riders uh, in London. And although I've written yeah one or two things about about platform work, um, this for me was really a kind of accidental stumbling uh, across this kind of work. 
because I had students who started working uh, for food delivery platforms. Uh, and I remember to kind of start with a little bit of an anecdote, one of my students said, you know, you must come and see what's happening with, with the changes in food delivery work. Uh, and I said, ah, you know, I'll come, you know, I'll talk to people, you know, we'll, 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 we'll try and figure these things out. Um, and luckily we, we turned up uh, to do some research with food delivery riders in London just before they had uh, what I still think, although I'd be fascinated to know if anyone has any earlier examples, one of the first ever strikes in, 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 in platform work uh, with food delivery riders in London. And this is one of the, the benefits of, uh, of doing the kind of research before a big strike is if you turn up after a big there a week before people kind of think you were you were were kind of in for the long haul um and a lot has changed since 2016 um which gosh is what my seven years uh yeah almost seven years of uh, of changes of new com companies starting of business models changing uh, and of strikes of, of various kinds um but one of the things that for me was very interesting about this kind of work um is really you know what I'm interested in is the ways in which people try and try and change their work. Um, so I spent a lot of time, yep, studying studying delivery, but also studying other kinds of low paid work in Britain, um, particularly kinds of work that people say are unorganizable, or work where there are big structural barriers to to workers forming unions uh, or entering into collective bargaining or, or trying to change their work in one way or another. And so very early on in this research, lots of people talked about these kinds of workers as being unorganizable, um, that there were problems with how the work was organized that would somehow kind of defeat, defeat labor organizing. Um, and we had many examples of this quite early on uh, in the UK. Uh, one of the members of parliament, uh, ironically for the Labour Party in the UK, uh, said that these workers couldn't organize because they didn't have shared workplaces. Um, so they couldn't find common cause together. Um, lots of academics at the time said, you know, they have uh, low market bargaining power. You know, these, these workers will struggle to, uh, to find sources of, of structural power. Um, and and one, of the, one researcher at the time says, you know, these aren't coal miners or railway workers. Uh, they can't bring the economy to a halt. So there were lots of criticisms early on about uh, the kind of capabilities of people to organize. Some commentators would say it was too precarious, that the workers were too young or there were too many migrants or the technology was too complicated or, or maybe a combination of all of these factors. Um, and these are arguments that are not old in a way. Um, you know, I previously did research on call centers uh, and lots of people have said similar things about call center work. Uh, where I live in London is a neighborhood that used to be docks uh, for hundreds of years. And of course, you know, 100 years ago in the UK, uh, people said dock workers were too precarious. Uh, you can probably see where, where my argument is going with, with these examples. Um, and so it's not the first time these things have been made about a kind of work. Uh, and it's certainly not, you know, I would imagine the last time we're going to hear some of these things said. But one of the ironies, of course, is that in the intervening seven years, what we've seen is uh, a huge explosion of industrial action, uh, both official unions, unofficial unions, uh, sanction strikes, wildcat strikes, protests, uh, all manner of, uh, of forms of collective action that have now taken place uh, across platform work. Um, and people might have come across some excellent research carried out by colleagues at uh, the University of Leeds, where they've tracked incidents of uh, uh, incidents of, uh, of protest on on platforms, and of course, Deliveroo now have the well, I would say the honour. They probably wouldn't say the honour of uh, of winning an award for this, of being the most protested platform uh, in the world. So huge numbers uh, of, of of strikes and and protests that have been targeted against them. Um, and so what I want to do with the remainder of this talk is to try and explain a little bit why this has happened. Um, so why has this kind of work become the center of, uh, of new kinds of forms of resistance, uh, new kind of labor strategies, perhaps, and how we can try and make sense of this and either learn uh, as academics, as trade unionists, as, uh, as workers in other sectors, you know, what can we learn from this experience? You know, why, 
you know, why is it happening? Um, and I want to start with a very obvious uh, point on this that I'm sure any of you who've spoken to platform workers could probably dispute some of the early claims about there being no workplaces or uh, people not being in connection with each other. Um, is it now a very well known kind of empirical fact that uh, there are dense networks uh, in these workplaces that people use, depending on which country you're in, in the UK, WhatsApp is incredibly common. Uh, for communication in, in other places, there are other kind of social media networks that people use. And so whilst there might not be a, a water cooler in the kind of more traditional sense of a, uh, a particular part of the workplace where people meet and talk and complain and so on, there are in a sense uh, kind of virtual water coolers, you know, these, these points in, in social media networks where people connect and people do what they've done for a very, very long time in, in work. Uh, people find places where other people do that kind of work and inevitably they complain about that work and talk about things uh, that they could try to do to change it. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these overlapping networks, you know, they've begun in individual cities, you know, they begin as a way to deal with the difficulties or the challenges of the work and then they become places where uh, where people can organize. Um, and these sorts of experiences have been repeated, you know, across across different contexts, across different uh, different countries and often then in between countries. And I think this is one of the important things to remember when we look at platform work is that platform workers did things before they were platform workers. Um, in the UK, there's a, a very large number of migrant workers who do this kind of work. And they worked in different kinds of industries before they came to the UK. They worked in different kinds of industries before they signed up for Deliveroo. They bring the social networks of migration of other kinds of work onto the platforms. Um, and of course, they also bring their own feelings and thoughts and desires and wants to that work uh, of things they want to get out of it, not only uh, what the companies might kind of tell us uh, people do this work for. Um, and so what I want to do is to make three arguments about this kind of work uh, that kind of, I guess, try to cut against that argument about precarity or, 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 or challenges to organizing in, uh, in, in platform work. Um, the first is that these kinds of workers aren't isolated. Uh, I kind of feel in many ways this argument is, is sort of settled. Uh, but in fact, what we find are increasing connections between platform workers, both at a local context, but also increasingly across uh, different jurisdictions in different places and so on. The second is that these connections are formed because of a lack of communication from platforms. Uh, that platforms often try to find ways to prevent workers from talking to each other. And rather than this succeeding in isolating people, what we instead find is that when there aren't easy ways to communicate with the platform or to communicate on the platform, people find other ways to have that kind of communication. But that this is also tied into an issue around negotiation, that if you don't provide channels for people to negotiate, uh, to mitigate problems with the work when they emerge, um, you know, to deal with the kind of contradictions of the labor process as they come about, issues tend to escalate. Um, and so the lack of communication from platforms to workers leads to escalating forms of worker action around shared issues. And really what we see in platform work is the kind of uh, widespread use of wildcat strike action, which, you know, if we're honest about it, isn't the kind of tactic at uh, the top of the list of many other kinds of workers in other kinds of sectors. Although maybe, you know, Amazon warehouses are becoming a place where, where wildcat strike action becomes more common. And then the final point that I want to make is about the internationalization of platforms, that there are already international connections that get formed through the internationalization of many of these companies. And that what I find most exciting about this is it lays a sort of technical basis for new kinds of solidarity between different groups of workers. So 
it lays a basis of new kinds of transnational solidarity that we could say maybe start from a different position to more traditional forms of international trade union federations or, or, or these kind of uh, forms of solidarity from above, we might be able to think about it. And so each of these, I argue, stems from the technical organization of this work. Uh, so the technical composition of platform work. Um, and I think the first example, if you've ever spoken to platform workers, you can see this clearly. You know, whenever you talk to platform workers, you can see that they're increasingly connected to each other, whether through WhatsApp or, uh, or, 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 or other forms of communication technology. The second dynamic about communication from platforms, um, you know, we can see this with the kind of widespread use of strike action uh, in the sector. But I also want to tell a story about one of the first times I came across this outside of the UK. Um, so I spent some time uh, doing fieldwork in India, in Bangalore, in the south of India. Um, and we, with a, a research team I was working with, we set off to go and talk to platform workers to try and find out what was happening in the city, to you know, try and get an impression of uh, of whether people were thinking of joining unions or, or had participated in, in strike action. Um, and we spent a long time looking for, for drivers. Uh, Bangalore is a big city with not the easiest traffic uh, to navigate. So we spent a lot of time sitting in the back of cars. Uh, and of course, if you want to find delivery riders, one of the things you can do is ask taxi drivers where they are, because of course they share the city together so they know where the busy busy places are. Uh, and so we found one junction that had, I don't know, two dozen, maybe three dozen uh, riders who were who were gathered around talking. Um, and so we started talking to them about, um, you know, what was happening. Uh, we said we'd looked online, you know, we hadn't seen any evidence of strike action in the city, uh, you know, that it looked to us like nothing was really happening. And one of the things they said is, you know, when we first started doing this work, you know, we were paid. Uh, 60 rupees a delivery. Uh, they were now getting about 30 rupees a delivery. So they'd lost about half of, uh, of the per drop income. And what the platform did, and maybe you've heard similar stories uh, in other contexts, I've certainly heard this in London before, is the platform emailed and text messaged all the drivers to tell them they were making this change. They didn't have a meeting to sit down with people. Uh, to negotiate the change or to, to inform them about it. They just did one-way communication. Uh, and what the riders told us is that um, they had changed this from happening uh, because they'd organized a strike of about three to 400 workers in that neighborhood. Uh, it hadn't been reported because the strike had been successful within a few hours. Uh, they'd kind of shaken the platform up enough that they decided to make a concession uh, and change the payment, the the payment, the payment system they were using, and so of course this didn't get reported, uh, and so from the outside it looked like uh, like nothing was happening. You know, on the other side of the city, people hadn't uh, hadn't heard uh, this in the you know that the, these things had happened, and so although there aren't many channels for communication, you know there's still the ability for people uh, to push back and change things. And, you know, these are very similar demands that we hear in other contexts. You know, if you speak to food delivery drivers in Bangalore, they talk about the usual things. They talk about the problems of pay, pay and pay. They talk about safety equipment. Uh, they talk about the danger of roads, uh, insurance, deactivation. That there are increasingly common grievances that emerge uh, from these kinds of work. Um, and so in the UK... You know, if you talk to drivers, they will tell you very similar stories. You know, we used to receive this much per hour. Um, you know, there are risks of driving on the road that aren't, uh, aren't covered by the platform. And so there's a pattern of food delivery platforms and to some extent to also taxi delivery, putting pressure uh, on pay rates of having very generous rates at the beginning of entering into cities and then progressively uh, lowering these rates. And unlike Bangalore, which is this example of a successful strike that had never really been publicized, 
there are very few channels for people to raise grievances about this. And I often compare this to many other kinds of low paid work. So if you work as a cleaner or a security guard, if you have a grievance about the work, you can talk to a supervisor. You can say, actually, I want to move my shift around. Or, you know, maybe if we had this small change, it would make us feel better about, uh, about something else. And because platforms exist in this, uh, what they would like to believe is a gray area around employment status, there's a refusal to enter into negotiations or to enter into mediation that we might find in other kinds of work that lead to these kinds of escalating action. Um, so something that could have been dealt with uh, you know, through, through smaller changes or, or, or these sorts of things instead become uh, much larger kinds of disputes. Um, I want to tell one other anecdote to illustrate the, the third point. Um, yeah, the, the third of my three points, um, which is about doing some field work in, in South Africa with Uber drivers. Um, the flight from London to Cape Town is quite a long flight. Um, and one of the ways to get into town uh, after landing at the airport is to to get an Uber. So, you know, you have this kind of first attempt to do some field work if you're, if you're coming into the city. Uh, and I remember getting into a cab and talking to an Uber driver. Um, you know, I was a bit jet lagged, chatting away about the city, about what, you know, what had happened, how nice the weather was, you know, what I was looking forward to doing in the city and these sorts of things. And so we talked for a while and he said at one point, oh, I've been following the protests in London. I said, all oh, right, you know, what have you learn about them. And he said, I, you know, on Twitter, I follow people uh, who are drivers in London. Uh, you know, I messaged them and said, you know, I hope it went well. We've been comparing our employment status to people in London. And so we talked away and he was saying, oh, you know, I'd really love to be introduced to people in the union there. And, he was, you know, we had this back and forth. And then I, I got out of the cab and it kind of left me thinking about a dynamic, uh, which I think is quite unique to this kind of work that there are lots of similar kinds of work in South Africa to London. Uh, there are lots of similar kinds of work in Montreal to Seoul. Um, there are lots of people who work as cleaners or security guards or uh, bus drivers, but there are not lots of people who see an identification of work in the same way. That one of the kind of things about, uh, about the Ubers and the deliveries of this world is they've pushed an image of what it's like to be a platform worker, that you're flexible and you know all the things that we, we hear and so on. But instead, this kind of creates a strange thing where, you know, 10 years ago, if I'd got a cab in Cape Town, they wouldn't have wanted to know what was happening with mini cab drivers in London. Uh, you know, they wouldn't have identified with, you know, protests that were happening there. But because of that kind of shared image of the Uber driver that's been advertised so, so much, there are these sorts of organic connections that people begin to make. Many of the protests are, of course, very uh, social media friendly. You know, people are, uh, are much more adept at, at promoting these things. And what we found with Deliveroo is, you know, the, uh, the first wave of strikes in the UK uh, was then replicated across Europe at Deliveroo. So people learning the tactics from each other, sharing things on, on WhatsApp or through Facebook or, or, or Twitter, and beginning to build these kinds of transnational networks uh, of learning what worked, what didn't, or, or, or what they could do to, to build these sorts of, uh, of protests. And so, and I'll, I'll, I'll start bringing it to a conclusion because it'd be great to hear uh, from some of you in the room, if you have points of debate or, or, or questions or so on, is that each of these three dynamics are kind of tendencies, I think, within platform work. Um, the first is about how connected many of these workers are. Um, if you have to use a smartphone in your work, you're much more A, likely to have a smartphone, and B, spend your time on a smartphone in between doing jobs, you know, to be used to using these kinds of communication technologies in your work, but also, you know, outside of work and how you organize and so on. And I think whilst digital communication can clearly be an important part of, you know, building networks of solidarity, of 
uh, of mobilizing people and so on. Um, the face-to-face -face connections that people form through the job are also key to, to bringing people together. And so what we see is a kind of work full of dense connections and networks that have been effectively used to organize in, uh, in some contexts. And in part, the platforms encourage this. Uh, the use of self-employment statuses is often, at least in the UK context, means you can't provide training at work. Uh, you can't provide too much direction over how to do the work because the platform is claiming not to be an employer. So for a lot of people who start this work, you immediately need to try and meet other people who do it to find out where the best places to wait are, to find out what happens when an order goes wrong, uh, you know, to find out how to deal with you know, the difficult features of the job uh, that come out in the kind of day-to-day -day, uh, day -day life. And so that lack of communication from platforms encourages a kind of bottom-up communication from workers themselves. Um, so there's almost a kind of uh, an inadvertent effect of the use of self-employment statuses has helped to develop collective identities and, uh, and connections amongst people who do this kind of work. This lack of communication initially was about trying to prevent platforms from being challenged in court uh, around employment status. And perhaps you followed the very, very long running legal cases in the UK around employment status. Um, you know, the, the delivery court cases have been back uh, in and out of court for, for seven, yeah, probably seven years now with appeals and, and, and so on. So there's been a very long running legal debate over these things in which at various points, delivery are prepared to change how contracts work to continue uh, not to meet their requirements under labor law uh, for these kinds of workers. Um, but rather than seeing this as a kind of success on the part of platforms, we can also see it something that uh, has given them a weakness in their ability to, uh, to undermine the potential for, 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 for workers to organize. It also means that there's that lack of communication I talked about that builds grievances. Uh, this isn't work that's free of grievances or, 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 or kind of problems or, or, or people wanting to organize around these things, but instead becomes something that people move to forms of action that might be harder to imagine in other kinds of work. Um, so one of the, the, the things I've always been interested in in London is, you know, there is a union that organizes delivery riders. It's organized strikes at various times, but there are always incidents that pop up of groups of workers not in the union who organize a strike and then come to the union and say, you know, we, we've been on strike for two days. Uh, you know, we'd like to talk to the union about kind of what to do next. Is there's a kind of bubbling up of, uh, of collective action that happens uh, across this kind of work. And then finally, uh, just to, to, to finish on that third example, is what I think is so exciting about this is, you know, in some ways we see the beginnings of, of new kinds of transnational, international solidarity. Um, to give you one example of this, uh, Deliveroo had its independent, uh, its initial public offering uh, on the London Stock Exchange, I think two years ago now. And drivers in the UK wanted to organize uh, a demonstration on the day, wanted to try and pressure Deliveroo into negotiating with the union. And the day became a kind of moment of focus for Deliveroo riders across the world. So in, in almost every country where Deliveroo operate, unions and groups of workers participated in a day of action. Uh, in some places they had strikes, in other places they had protests. Um, the union also organized a very serious campaign of targeting investors to tell them if you invest in companies like this, you should expect there to be labor unrest. Uh, these are companies that treat workers badly uh, and workers you know, have and continue to find ways to, to protest about this. Um, and in some ways we can look back at the delivery campaign and say, well, they don't have a union contract. They've never won a pay rise. You know, there are many kind of 
traditional markers of success that, that we don't see with this organizing. But the Financial Times, which we should be clear is, you know, not a newspaper that's often on the side of unions or, or workers, uh, was incredibly damning about Deliveroo uh, and their IPO uh, a couple of years ago, is they said as a result of worker organizing and as a result of unions in the sector, Deliveroo had had the worst IPO in the entire history of, uh, of the London Stock Exchange. And a, a, around £2 billion pounds in valuation was wiped off uh, off Deliveroo's public offering. So kind of huge institutional damage was done to the, to the company. Um, and what we now see is a, a union recognition deal that's been signed with a, a kind of mainstream union uh, that's a different union to, to the union that, that riders organize with. But we're now beginning to see a shift in the relationship between these platforms and unions. From previously saying they would never talk to unions, they're now beginning to think about the kinds of relationships they can build uh, and the kinds of, uh, of things they might have to do to continue operating. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, as somebody who starts their research with the firm belief that all kinds of work are organizable, there's kind of none, none that exist in this kind of unorganizable uh, category, it's been incredibly exciting over the last seven years to see the tactics, the strategies, the ways that people find, you know, in these kinds of work in different contexts to build collective power and start trying to, to wield it. But I think as research, we're now entering into a phase where, you know, we can't just talk about how strikes do happen in this sector because there's a long history of it now. And instead, the question is, well, how do these kinds of workers win gains and concessions that will improve their working lives, you know, not just today or tomorrow, but think about reshaping the sector more widely. And I think for trade unionists, there's a really interesting question here about what kind of unions are appropriate or what can existing unions learn from these struggles and think about how we can take, you know, the best kind of strengths of the labor movement and these new creative experiences of workers who are you know, in many ways at the cutting edge of, uh, of organizing in these ways, to learn from each other uh, and think about ways uh, that we don't end up in a, in a kind of dystopian self-employed future, but we end up in a future where, where workers' power is not something that uh, is written off because of technology, uh, but helps to reshape that technology uh, for working people. Thank you very much. So, well, thanks a lot for a great presentation that was really, I think, appreciated by everybody here. And there will surely be questions, comments, people will want to. So put your hands up and. Uh, hi, um, thanks for the fascinating presentation. I had a question uh, about <clears throat> what you described as, um, you know, sharing experiences and building transnational solidarities between workers who work for the same platforms, like delivery uh, uh, um, workers or Uber drivers. Did you observe a, a similar phenomenon of experience sharing and, uh, you know, solidarity is building across different platforms, such as Uber drivers watching what delivery workers do? And uh, so in order to, you know, start building something akin to uh, class consciousness, you know what I mean? or even maybe taxi drivers. Uh, second question is, uh, Anne, will, uh, I'll give you the metric. Yes, thank you. And your friend, thank you for, for the presentation. Yes, um, um, I just wanted to ask more about um, the, the, the links between um, collectives and unions, because you, you, you say, yes, there is a, uh, different unions, but IWGB and IDCU are very different, and now there is also conflict between themselves. And and then the agreement with GMB is also very problematic, I think. And uh, I'm I'm in Be in Brussels, and now we have the same type of of agreement with uh, UBT, and um, it's really I think very very. Um, dangerous to, to go in, in, in this direction. And I wanted to know what do you think about this new um, social dialogue between Uber 
and the unions, the yellow unions. <laughs> I think we could maybe have a category in the next um, few uh, 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 years, we could have a cartography of um, the yellow unions in Europe since uh, uh, thanks to Europe. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it's really nice for unionism. <laughs> If I may just add on uh, what uh, Anne just said, uh, there is also the um, uh, UCWP uh, track in Canada doing the same kind of uh, yellow unionism, or some would say, maybe not. So, do we take an answer or a comment from, uh, yeah, from Jamie, if you want to react to at least these two first questions? Yeah, th these are excellent first questions. One is slightly easier to answer than the other, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, look, I mean, I think um, for a lot of, often when I talk about platform work, what I'm really talking about are three different kinds of work, uh, food or package delivery, uh, taxi transportation, or, or kind of cleaning and care work. Um, and I think what we've seen is, Things happening very early in, in transportation work, um, you know, particularly in food delivery, uh, but also with, with taxi transportation. And I think there are lots of similarities between these. And I think, uh, you know, what we find is that Uber operates everywhere. Um, and so there's a kind of obvious connection with Uber. Uber eats in many jurisdictions, but, you know, delivery is predominantly Europe. Uh, as well as, you know, had been in, in, in Australia and, and some parts of the Middle East. And so I think there are increasing connections that move beyond just the identification with the platform itself as the employer, but as the kinds of work. Um, and for example, there's been lots of solidarity between food delivery workers who work for different platforms. Uh, so sending messages of solidarity when there are strikes or protests or, you know, if a driver is killed, you know, there are these similar identifications. Uh, and so I think people see something in those uh, shared experiences of work. And this is one of the kind of ironies about management technologies, right? That they can also, you know, that experience is becoming a shared one uh, for lots of kinds of workers. In terms of the, the collectives and, and unions question, uh, I mean, some of you might know I've done a lot of research with with IWGB, which is is one of these grassroots unions. Um, in the UK, we have uh, a single union federation uh, of which GMB is a member and the IWGB is not. So broadly speaking, you know, this is about the union mainstream and then these kind of newer trade unions that are often much more focused on things like internal democracy, uh, on taking action and so on. I, I guess one of the things that's worth saying is the UK has a long history of yellow unionism um, and of you know, unions that are more prepared to collaborate with, uh, with management in one way or another. But I think we also have to look at the kind of interests of some of these unions and what they're trying to achieve. Is my reading of the GMB deal is that this is just a different model of what unions should be doing. And this is a very large union. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, hundreds of thousands of members that is facing a declining membership and is looking for ways to reinvent the union in one way or another into new sectors. And so has made a bargain that it's better to give up on employment status and to try and build membership than it is to, to organize strikes uh, and take a much more uh, confrontational approach. Now, you know, we can have critiques of this, and I, I certainly do, but it comes out of a different understanding of, uh, of, of power at work. Uh, for these more grassroots unions, it's about building workers' own power to do these things. And for some of these much larger unions, it's that power comes around through, you know, the elite of a union who negotiate on behalf of other people who, who make deals on, on their behalf. But what I think is so fascinating about this is seven years ago, if you'd said Uber would sign a deal with a mainstream union, people would have said, no way will they ever do this. 
And so although it's a bad thing that we're beginning to see the emergence, I think, of yellow unionism in the sector, it also shows the pressure that these companies have come under, that now they feel they have to at least show that they're doing something in relation to trade unions. Uh, so it's a kind of a step back and a step forward at the same time. My name is Bionni from South Korea. I want to ask you about social dialogue in UK. Uh, don't you have any attempt to proceed social dialogue between platforms and unions and sometimes including the, the government? So if you have any case, then could you say again, say about that? Thank you. Hi, I'm Hewan Kwan from Seoul, Korea. Um, I do agree with you that uh, those platform workers are increase, increasingly connected to each other, and we are witnessing a rise of collective um, power uh, among them. But I, um, I don't. Uh, I would like to ask you if. It applies only to local-based, you know, platform workers, because if you think about click workers working in Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example, do you still argue that those workers are organizable because they work at home, scattered across the globe, etc.? So, yeah, again, these are yeah, these are excellent questions. I I think the first thing. Yeah, the first thing on social dialogue. I mean, the current context in Britain uh, is a context without much social dialogue. Um, we're currently going through the largest strike wave in Britain for the last 30, 40 years, depending on who you ask. Uh, and the current government response is to make it harder for unions to go on strike. Um, so the kind of previous social dialogue models that may have been in place in, in Britain in the past um, have definitely fallen away. Um, so the state hasn't played any serious role uh, in intervening for social dialogue between platforms uh, and workers in the UK. There's been very, very little of this. Um, it's worth saying that, and this is something that I'm sure is, is the case in, in, in Canada, uh, I'm not so sure about South Korea, is there's a very close relationship between the people who work for platforms, and by this I mean the kind of senior leadership teams in platforms, and the major political parties uh, in Britain. So both uh, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, the two major political parties in the UK, many of the advisors have worked for Deliveroo or have worked in the, the London office of Uber. So there's a very kind of close relationship of lobbying uh, you know, a special advisor to a, a senior government minister was the head of PR at Deliveroo for a long time uh, and helped to lobby for changes in, in, in regulations and so on. And one of the things that I think is interesting about this is, is many of these people will speak quite openly about their project. Um, and one of the, these people who worked for the Conservative Party in Deliveroo, uh, I saw him speak uh, in London and he said, the thing to remember is this isn't just about changing work for Deliveroo. This is about changing work more widely. Um, and what we need to change is the social security and benefit system to catch up with the new work of Deliveroo. So there are many people who see this as a wedge to open up debates and discussions about social issues much more widely, very, very much on behalf of capital rather than than on, on the side of uh, side of workers. Um, the other question I think is a, is a really important one is there are certainly some kinds of work that are much harder to organize, um, not to say they're unorganizable, but they're much harder to organize. And I think online work is a very good example of this. Um, this is much harder. If you don't have face-to-face -face conversations, it's much harder to do these things. Um, what I would point you towards if you're if you're interested is I I am involved in a journal called Notes from Below that publishes worker writing. And we published a piece a couple of years ago by an Amazon mechanical Turk worker who's been involved in an organizing project called Turkoptican, uh, 
um, which is trying to bring people together to to organize on on MTurk. And she wrote a narrative piece about the challenges of it and how difficult it is. But the same dynamics are there in in Mechanical Turk as as Deliveroo. It's very difficult to know how to do the job. So people find online communities to talk about how to do the work. People seek out other people who do that work. They share grievances and they start talking about ways that they can do these things. Certainly, it's not as developed as this in-person kinds of work because these relationships take longer to form, but they're still there. The kind of embryonic relationships uh, uh, are still there, which you know I find as somebody who thinks all work can you know can be organized in some way to find it in those incredibly difficult environments i think is yeah is incredibly exciting right maybe i w- uh, would like to maybe build on what one thing that you said the fact that the delivery uh, became uh, assistant or uh, executive to the government people did they see it as a bridge to how do I say to, to to ramp down any employment norms and that we have Um, I think we. I think it's very interesting because we see it more and more now with the, what we call the hustle economy, of, where people like, okay, it's not any, it's not work anymore. It's like it's just a way to get money, you know. And this, uh, for me, it's a major trend. So I would uh, uh, tend to agree with you. My my question me is more about the fact about. Of course, if we want to fight or if we want to be in solidarity with the workers, most of the time we think about them, about uh, like, how can I say? We say they're, they should be, they, they're not really self-employed. They, they are real. They should be wage earners and then they should be, be able to become to uh, be able to join a union and then uh, blah, blah, blah. But when we speak to workers, They kind of like the fact that their autonomy, but we know they're not so autonomous because they work when the Uber wants them to work. But you know, they're at, they they have the spirit of being self-employed and everything. And moreover, uh, most of a lot of the time, they they work for a lot of platform at the same time. They work for uh, Uber Eats and they work for DoorDash and they work for this and they, they have like uh, like we said we saw this uh, afternoon at Eva drivers who have three four five phones and they they handle different devices and the old school union movement that we have it's always like we need a group in one business and we make a deal and and this makes it very complicated you know what i mean So in Quebec, we have something which is called the CRE, the sectorial decree. And in some places in Europe, I think in France, you have it. Like, you know where there's a convention, a collective agreement for every cleaners or every people working in restaurants, etc. So in, is this an option? Is this something that is discussed in England? Uh, having like a, this uh, sectorial agreement? Because... If we want to be true, even for example in California, there was a plan. That, well, it was people vote against, but uh, to have like a, a hourly uh, hourly wages for for the workers. But to be honest, if we really want to do this, how do you calculate this? The person is working for four platforms at the same time. Will we give them four times the minimum wage? You know, no, like. The structure of the work makes it extremely difficult to. to I don't know if I, if you follow me, but so in my opinion, so just to keep it short, uh, what about like sectorial decrees? Uh, is it a solution? Uh, because somehow I think it could. No, it could like. Uh, I don't know. It, this this sectorial decree came. It's, it's somehow more designed to the, the complication of the industry. Hello, Jamie. This is Ravi. Uh, uh, I have one question. Uh, rega- maybe it's in con- in, uh, related to what uh, Yannick uh, just um, asked. Uh, we speak a lot about the um, uh, salaria- uh, compromise salarial for this, the fordist compromise. And now, two years ago, Uber proposed in Canada Uber Flexible Plus. 
labor, which while preserving the status of micro entrepreneur or uh, self-employed uh, workers, were, uh, it's offering access to some ba basic services in terms of uh, uh, access to insurance for dental care, for uh, medical basic medical care, and even for tuition fees. So some of these activity or initiatives are being used to as retention tactics or to nudge to nudge people inside the network to keep them to retain them inside the network based on what you are were saying uh, do you think are we closing to have such compromise historical compromise can we say are we approaching towards having a platform compromise where and what might be the implications of the definition of a salaried or a waged uh, worker? Thank you. Okay, can we have your answers on this? Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, again, these are great questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the annex that um, I think it's incredibly important to listen to what people want. Um, the kinds of demands that people are making and to think about why they're making those demands. It's a bit easier in the UK, this debate around employment status, because we have, we have three employment statuses. Um, we have self-employment, we have employment, and we have an intermediate category, which is a kind of dependent, uh, it's called a worker status. So it has the flexibility to choose when you work, but you retain a number of uh, legal rights, minimum wage, holiday pay, uh, some protections around trade union rights and so on. And so this is what delivery riders argue for. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find a delivery rider who wants full employment status. This is not what people are asking for. Um, and it can come with huge gains. So the IWGB has a union recognition deal at a gig economy company that collects blood samples uh, and takes them from private hospitals, private clinics to laboratories. Uh, these workers were recategorized as worker status and it in, gives them entitlement to all the holiday pay that they've missed out on the whole time they've been working at the company. Uh, so workers get a huge cash bonus. Uh, well, not a bonus, right? It's, it's stolen wages from the past. And so there's a kind of very big appeal of worker status because it can come with, uh, you know, with, with being paid and so on. But I also think, you know, this uh, reluctance to talk about employment for a lot of people comes from what they think employment is. That employment is inflexible, it's badly paid, you can't choose when to work, you get abused by a manager, uh, it doesn't have many benefits. That for many people, their experience of employment has been so negative that the freedom and flexibility and these things that are told to us about self-employment look much, much more appealing. And so in some ways, it's a much more damning indictment of employment than it is of, uh, of self-employment. And I always remember something a driver said to me once is I said, you know, have you worked in other kinds of work? And he said, yeah, I've worked in bars, in cafes, in, you know, these sorts of work. And what I hated about it was having a manager who would tell me what to do. Um, you know, who would tell me I can't do things, who would be rude to me, who would shout at me. And he said, what I love about Deliveroo is nobody ever does that. Um, of course, he had many other things he didn't like about it, right? Didn't pay him enough and so on. Um, but I think we can't forget that many of those negative experiences of work are what drive people into, uh, into these sorts of things. I guess just to say briefly, I mean, we don't have sectoral bargaining in the UK. Uh, we haven't for a very, very long time. Uh, we have some things that are a little bit close to it, but 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 nothing in the same way. There are no discussions about having sectoral bargaining uh, of this kind of work. That's that's not on the cards. But interestingly, this can cause other kinds of problems in some jurisdictions. Um, so there's some really excellent research being done in Brazil at the moment. And one of the slogans of Brazilian food delivery riders is that they don't want a union um, because the union is seen as entering into a relationship with the state where a union is selected for them. They have to pay for the union. 
the union will take dodgy deals. You know, so often these things are expressed in different kinds of ways. But I think one of the big challenges for unions is to think about how work has changed and what negotiation means. And I think things like multi-apping, this is a very confusing thing for collective bargaining. But also we have to ask about why multi-apping happens, um, that this is part of the, uh, the chaotic nature of the platform economy, that we have five food delivery platforms and six taxi platforms, when really what we need is one that pays fairly uh, that is, you know, reliable for workers to use and so on. And so I think, you know, one of the solutions we could look at with these things is, you know, it's an old idea, but nationalizing these platforms and having a single platform that does this. You know, for example, I wouldn't mind paying more to take a taxi on a nationalized platform if it also cross-subsidized and worked with public transport. So you encourage people to use public transport where possible, and if they want to take a cab, they pay for it. Uh, and it has a relationship with the other kinds of services that we're providing. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to have all these companies undercutting each other and ripping workers off to provide these services. It's a kind of uh, a function of where we're at in the current stage of, uh, of capitalism, that venture capital is being gambled in these ways to, to try and make a profit, which I'm hoping this slightly leads on to the second question. Um, which is, you know, do I think we're at the point where a compromise is approaching? I think we're nowhere near the point of the balance of class forces where a Fordist compromise is on the cards. Um, I think what we're seeing is the continued collapse of what's left of a Fordist compromise. Um, but what I think is interesting is that for a long period of time, these platforms could rely on a big surplus of labor. Um, so particularly churning through migrant communities, uh, of being able to draw many, many people onto the platform uh, and, and essentially burn them out. So Deliveroo in London, the average job tenure is 11 months. Uh, people last for 11 months and then they leave. This is on, on average. Uh, and I think what we're seeing with the retention is the beginnings of the fear from these platforms that they can no longer continue to operate in this way. Um, so to give you one example of this, you never used to have to wait longer than two or three minutes for an Uber in London. It was astonishingly quick to get a cab. Now, sometimes you have to wait 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, drivers regularly cancel on customers now where they never used to because the supply of, uh, of available labor is, is reducing. Because during the pandemic, many people decided to no longer do this kind of work. Uh, they didn't want to take on the risks of it. They've, they've looked for work elsewhere. And so I think this is the kind of crisis of the business model beginning to come out, that it makes sense to enter into a, a yellow union deal or to offer bits of insurance because the long-term kind of viability of these platforms is starting to come into question. Uh, and I guess the issue is whether workers can fight for a better compromise uh, and whether they can win that uh, from these platforms. If that sort of answers your question, Rabbi. Um, well, I, does anybody else have a question? Otherwise, I'd maybe go ahead with something. Um, I found very interesting what you were uh, saying. We, um, with some colleagues, we did some interviews with young immigrants also working, um, and we found kind of the same thing, the appreciation also, which Yannick mentioned, appreciation for flexibility and all this. We had a few women, and I think we can all agree that there aren't very many women. Could you speak on, on the gender issue? Um, and also what you just mentioned, the uh, average uh, retention rate, 11 months. Uh, all of these young immigrants that we had, a lot of them were students, um, some not necessarily, but a lot of them were. And so they were obviously thinking of leaving. And this kind of leads to another question. First, the gender. And then the second thing, um, and I think when we talk about precarious jobs, we're often thinking, well, is this, um, there was, I think, a title of a book some time ago, is it a bridge or a trap? So these people that stay only 11 months, are they on a bridge going on to something better or another type of precarious job, which is not necessarily better? Or, um, and then maybe within, of course, we don't have, you know, perfect statistics on this clearly. Um, how many people are stuck in the trap and how many people manage to go on? Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent questions. I mean, I think in terms of the gendering of this work, 
I think this is an important reminder that this work, although the organization of it through platforms is new, this is not new work, right? Uh, delivery and transportation is an incredibly old form of work uh, and has been historically gendered in, in very specific ways. Um, so taxi driving has, has long been gendered as a, as a, as a male profession. Um, and the, the women that I speak to who do do this kind of work in London uh, often talk about the two kinds of pressures they face doing this work. Uh, first, from other drivers. Um, so other drivers who compete with them or, or end up producing a kind of difficult working environment for them in various ways, either directly or indirectly. Uh, so, you know, sometimes directly through harassment, but also more generally. But then also the safety of doing this kind of work at night, that many people feel intimidated uh, to work in the nighttime economy uh, and to leave, you know, their moped locked up in a, uh, a neighborhood at night and so on. That there are high incidents of violent crime uh, often associated with this kind of work, uh, which kind of further gender genders the work. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the kind of rooting this in the longer history of it, I think, helps to, helps to make sense of it. Um, what I would say in terms of, uh, uh, of the further question about retention is I think this varies in many ways depending on the kind of migrant groups we're talking about. Um, so in, in London, there's a, a very high number of Brazilian migrants who work for Deliveroo. Uh, many of these migrants have come to the UK to do this kind of work uh, with an intention of going back to Brazil. So coming to earn money, uh, living with other Brazilians, uh, trying to keep their costs low, making money, and then going back to Brazil uh, afterwards. Then there are other migrant groups. The neighborhood I live in is majority Bengali, uh, many second, third generation migrants. Uh, there is no intention to, to work for a small amount of time and then, and then move on. And I think these kinds of work can be much more of a trap uh, for migrants who, who are following that kind of that trajectory. I also think one of the things that differentiates this work from other kinds of low paid or precarious work is that often people take on additional costs in order to do the work. Uh, so buying a car to work for Uber, taking out a loan for a car, taking out a loan for a moped, that the trapping element because of the kind of debt bondage that's often associated with this kind of work means it's much harder to get out of than being a cleaner or a security guard uh, or, or, or kind of equivalent job and i think you know a lot of people have been pushed into kind of greater levels of uh, of poverty or those kinds of exploitative relationships because they've been promised that this work will be different that they can earn more money they can be flexible and so on um, but I think a lot of this depends on what kinds of labor markets these platforms are trying to recruit from. Uh, you know, whether it's people who are already in the city or people who are drawn into the city. And so just a very small example, uh, I have some colleagues, uh, uh, Rafael Groman and, uh, and Mateus Mendonca, who do research in Brazil on Brazilian migrants people who are migrating into cities. And then we do comparative research about Brazilian migrants in the UK. And the experiences are very, very different because we're talking about different kinds of flows. And so I think part of this is about the specificity of the local context, if, if that makes sense. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. I, uh, uh, I have a question about the um, conditions for making workers to, to be more organizable. So today I, uh, in my understanding that you talked about, you touched upon the technology and the particular characteristic of the uh, particular capital called platform, right? Platform economy. Um, and I was wondering, in, so uh, those, uh, those stories that you share with us today, this revolving around the shared experience, right? So to be able to organize and do, uh, to connect to others, we have to know that uh, we have to identify, you know, with them, right? And I was wondering, in your view, and from your extensive research on collective action of gig workers, what kind of other kinds of conditions that uh, make more possible to organize workers? Thank you. 
think it will be the last question. So maybe you can go, uh, Jamie, with the answer. Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I kind of think about the shared experience and the ability to communicate with each other as being the kind of laying a basis for people to 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 build a subjectivity together. So to kind of start building those uh, those ways of thinking about how the work could be different or, 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 or what they could do about it. But I think what's been interesting in London is the success of uh, kind of smaller, more radical unions to organize with uh, migrant workers has been about taking the kind of best traditions of the labor movement and combining them with the traditions or cultural things that bring people together in uh, in different migrant groups. Um, so that, for example, the IWGB is a bilingual union. Uh, this probably sounds less unusual uh, in the Canadian context, but in the UK, this is the only bilingual union. Um, it's both in English and Spanish uh, for Latin American cleaners. So taking seriously questions around language, um, and ensuring that people can organize in the language they feel comfortable in, and also thinking about the role of, of culture in different ways. Um, so, for example, organizing with Brazilian workers, you know, organizing around, uh, you know, having barbecues and social events that are the sorts of things that people do in their own communities, or organizing around moped repair shops. Uh, so, building the kinds of connections essentially meeting people where they are. So finding the things that people already do and building building from those social connections. And I think there's a risk sometimes that, you know, we want to impose a way of doing union organizing or collective organizing from our own experiences of doing it, from our own national histories and so on. Um, and I think part of the success of organizing in the gig economy has been these other ways of thinking about what does it mean to be a union today? Um, it's very traditional in the UK for unions to meet once a month and then to go to the back room of a pub and sit in a pub and, you know, do these sorts of things. If you want to organize with other groups of workers, this may not be the best way uh, to bring people together or to make them feel comfortable, right? You know, particularly if, if people don't drink. Um, so it's a thinking about how we adapt the practices of union, unionism as it exists and making it accessible to, to other groups of workers. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. And I think that kind of brings me to, to the end of the time. So yeah, thanks for the questions. They were all really excellent. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think well, everybody will join me in thanking you for this presentation.